거. 굿 데이 에브리원. 마간당 아로 sa inyo. Welcome po sa isa na namang episode ng online series ni Inang Pamantasan, kung saan ang pagkatuto ay walang hangganan. Ito ang PNU Talks. I'm Rachelle Ballesteros Lentao, your Learning from Home buddy. I'm here to present how interesting forensic linguistics is and to convince you to engage in forensic linguistics. And thus, the title of my talk, What is Forensic Linguistics? and why every teacher must engage in FL. Here's the overview of my presentation. I'll first define forensic linguistics, provide its scope, then share what forensic linguists do. For the last two parts of my talk, I'll attempt to rally all of you to engage in FL with the whys or reasons, and lastly, the hows of engaging in FL. As some of you may not be into linguistics, I'll first clarify some terms. Linguistics is the scientific study of human language, including its structure and use. Linguistics has many types. There's theoretical, descriptive, historical, social linguistics, dialectology, and another is applied linguistics. Applied linguistics puts linguistic theories into practice. It studies and responds to real-life problems. And according to Tucker in 2021, applied linguistics is the application of findings and techniques from research in linguistics and related disciplines to solve practical problems. On to the first part of my talk. What is forensic linguistics? The word forensics has to do with solving a crime. Also, the term has to do with the courts or legal system. In its broadest sense, forensic linguistics is the interplay between linguistics, that's the science of language, and the law, including the law enforcement. According to Olson in 2013, Forensic linguistics is a branch of applied linguistics that deals with the application of linguistic knowledge and techniques to legal issues. Forensic linguistics is also known as language and law, law and language, legal language, legal linguistics, jury linguistics, and legal discourse. According to Coulthard and Johnson in 2010, forensic linguistics is subdivided into these three areas. The study of the written language of the law, the study of interaction in the legal process, and the description of the work of the forensic linguist when acting as an expert witness. The study of the written language of the law or legal texts covers the nature and reform of the legal language. In this area, linguists are interested in analyzing the use of legalese in contracts, how legal documents are understood or not understood by their users, and how complex or readable these documents are. Aside from examining the difficulties users may have with the legal texts, this area is also into the reform of the legal language. This is where the plain language movement comes in. I am a plain language advocate, but discussing about the plain language entails another episode. But let me just emphasize that plain language is all about providing a communication in which the wording, structure, and design are so clear that intended readers can easily find what they need understand what they find, and use that information. The next area of forensic linguistics is all about the study of legal linguistic practices. So this concerns courtroom discourse or the study of spoken interaction in legal contexts. Here, linguists examine the nature of police interviews with suspects, the problems created for 
vulnerable witnesses in courtroom discourse, and even the difficulties experienced by those who do not speak the language of the court. The third area covers the use of language evidence in legal and forensic contexts. Here, forensic linguists are invited as expert witnesses. Two of the most frequent types of cases in forensic linguistics involve disputed meanings and auth questioned authorship. In disputed meanings, experts shed light on the confusability of trademark disputes, meaning of words, and expressions and adequacy of product warnings. In questioned authorship, a forensic linguist is involved in the analysis of suicide letters, an argument as to who wrote a text. A forensic linguist can also analyze language samples from multiple authors and then determine which author's language matches the disputed text the most. Two popular pieces of literature where this technique has been used are J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and Down Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Unfortunately, linguistic evidence is not yet accepted in the Philippine courts. But in other countries such as in the UK and the US, linguistic expert opinions are already employed to help solve cases. Next. I'm now going to answer, what do forensic linguists do? Forensic linguists do a careful and systematic analysis of language. Linguists who primarily investigate written language examine features such as spelling, sentence construction, word choice, punctuation, etc. By comparison, Linguists who principally examine spoken language focus on accent, dialect, pronunciation, tone of voice, speed, and rhythm of speech, to name a few. Most work in forensic linguistics is concerned with linguistic evidence. Linguistic evidence can have three different meanings according to Durant and Leung in 2016. First, linguistic evidence can mean language data like text messages, letters, product warnings, trademark signs associated with crime or dispute. These are evidence in the sense that such data, in principle, just like Footprints, blood samples, or ballistics will be interpreted, then embedded in a legal argument, and then later submitted as evidence in a legal case. The second kind of linguistic evidence can mean the informed interpretation of such data mentioned in number one by an expert linguist. Such linguistic analysis may take the form either of a written report or spoken courtroom testimony, and it may have a direct impact on the outcome of the case. A third sense of linguistic evidence refers to the cumulative published or publicly stated knowledge gathered through linguistic research regarding how language works or sometimes fails to work. When this kind of evidence is brought to bear on problems in law, it can contribute to reform of legal institutions and procedures by informing public policy. An example would be how the research of the complexity of jury instructions by Charo and Charo in 1979 led to the reforms of simplifying the jury instructions. Forensic linguistics can be understood as a combination or layering of these varied notions of linguistic evidence. It brings expert analysis of language use based on linguistic research 
to bear within the legal system on questions that involve contested material consisting of utterances, text, or some other manifestation of language behavior. Most experts working with forensic linguistics have a degree in linguistics. Many forensic linguists also have a degree of advanced training in other fields such as law, psychology, sociology, and criminology. I'm now in my third point. There's this famous saying that goes, when the why is clear, the how is easy. So at this point, I would like to highlight the reasons why every teacher must engage in FL. It is our moral duty to help in the delivery of justice. By engaging in forensic linguistics, we help people find the truth. By doing a systematic analysis of language, we can find who's guilty, who said what, who wrote what, what happened, why did it happen, how did it happen. And lastly, we protect the innocent and we even protect ourselves. And for the fourth and last part of my talk, how can we engage in forensic linguistics? Do you need to take an additional degree or a certificate course in linguistics? Not really. You can work on a forensic linguistic task by involving yourself in analyzing the language. These are some practical activities which involve forensic linguistic analysis or forensic linguistics. One is doing plagiarism detection. The widespread use of technology and shift to online learning have made it easier to plagiarize the work of others. We know that plagiarism is claiming others' work or as one's own work without proper attribution. The detection of plagiarism can either be manual or software assisted. It's about examining the language used in the outputs of our students. The second way of how we teachers can engage in FL is through authorship identification. In online teaching, we have students. We may have students who are called freeloaders. These are students who have not really contributed significantly in a group's output. We can do authorship identification by analyzing the students' works and comparing the styles of their writing. Whose work? Who's the real author? And these are some of the questions that we can answer in authorship identification. The third way of being involved in FL is doing document examination. Phishing scams abound. They trick us into giving them personal information. And we can check the authenticity of these emails by analyzing closely the source, whether there are grammatical errors and natural language use. And doing such will help us detect whether these are real emails or just fake ones. So at this point, let me share with you a phishing scam that I got involved in. It was May of last year. I slept late at that time around 5 a.m. That w waking up at past 9 or 9.40 in the morning, I would say that uh, I was not yet fully conscious at that time. Then upon checking my phone, I received this email from a certain Professor Cheryl R. Peralta. By the way, Dr. Peralta is our current Vice Rector for Academic Affairs in USD. This is the message. Did you get the notification in regards to the meeting scheduled for May 15, 2020? I didn't get the warning sign. First is the use of in regards to. Thinking that it's a real message or email from my superior, I answered her with, No, I did not get any not notification from you, Dr. Peralta, Rochelle. Then I got a reply. All right, details of the meeting will be sent to you. Are you busy at the moment? 
I answered. Just woke up, ma'am, but I'm okay. Russia. Another warning sign here. I did not even notice the sender. That's not Dr. Peralta's official email. Then another warning sign. The reply, I need your immediate assistance with a question mark. So why with a question mark? My major blunder was to even give my phone number. Then, okay, look at the reply. Okay. I wanted to call you now, but my phone is off the charging port. Okay. I wanted to call you now, but my phone is off. The charging port is bad and yet to be fixed due to the present situation. I'm typing from my tablet. I can only be connected by email on my tablet. I replied again. All right, ma'am. Waiting for your instructions po. Then the response, I need an instant transfer from you for just 50000 for my cousin funeral to the person in charge of the ceremony after I transfer it back to you. I have gotten to my transfer limit for the day. It's urgent. This was when I realized that something was wrong, but it's already late. I already gave my phone number. A few minutes after, someone started contacting me via WhatsApp. Okay, I remember it's a call. I got so scared because that guy, I, I still remember it's a guy. And he attempted to contact me several times using different numbers okay, with varied country codes. So that's really a hard lesson learned on my end. But from that time on, I have been more critical of the emails that I receive, mining the source, grammatical errors the, the sender would have. So for the past uh, 15 or so minutes, I have attempted to answer these questions. What is forensic linguistics? What do forensic linguists do? Why must every teacher engage in FL? And how can every teacher engage in FL? I hope to have picked your interest in forensic linguistics and persuaded you to engage in forensic linguistic analysis to help in the delivery of justice. These are the references that I used for this presentation. Thank you for listening. I would love to read your comments or questions about this episode. I'd gladly respond to them. You may even email me at rbilintao at usd.edu.ph. Please also like and share this episode. This has been Rochelle Balesteros Lintao for PNU Talks. Audio